What up, folks? Mahan Khalifas here yet again. Uh, tonight, I'm going to read you chapter four of the autobiography of Big Bill Haywood. Uh, he refers to it on the inside as Bill Haywood's book. But that's the title it's published under on the cover is the autobiography of Big Bill Haywood. Chapter four, Silver City. The road to Silver City was through a country that was rugged, bleak, and gray. No habitations except the occasional stations, most of them deserted, and a farm here and there. Not a tree to be seen in the entire distance. Nothing but crooked, gnarled sagebrush, greasewood, and stretches of browse. At least this was true until one came to the river. There the country was broken up into the foothills with high mountains behind them. Approaching the first summit, my thoughts went back to a story told me by Bill Coulter years before about being chased down this road by Indians when he was driving a stage. I could imagine the flying stage coach and Bill throwing the buckskin into his team with a band of Indians behind whooping and yelling, but never getting close enough to the galloping horses to shoot an arrow at the driver. Before I got to Jack uh, Bedouin's, I was hungry and thirsty. I had a few dollars in my pocket, but I thought, hell, what good is money anyway? Here at least was one place where a carload of $20 gold pieces would not buy a square meal. Why should money buy a meal, I wondered. Money did not seem to me an equivalent of value, an equivalent of labor, or an equivalent of anything else. This was something I would have to look into. At Jordan Valley, I turned my horse into pasture, hung my saddle and bridle up in the livery stable, and took a stage for Silver City. When we got there, I went to a Chinese restaurant and afterward knocked around the town for an hour or so. I was looking for a place to sleep that night. A man said to me, I got a bed in the old Potosi shaft house. You can roll in with me until your blankets come, but you better come up and look at the place. So if you happen to come in late, you won't stumble and fall down the shaft in the dark. I went up to the shaft house with him. There were several rolls of blankets scattered about a deep open shaft into the old mine without any cover or railing around it. I used this place as a lodging house for some days after my blankets arrived. I did not go to the races, but asked the men to get my saddle and horse in Jordan Valley on their way home and take them back to the ranch. The first morning I was up early and went to the Blaine mine, rustling a job. I did this for several mornings and sometimes at the noon hour as well, but without success. Hutchinson was the name of the manager. He had been in Nevada years before. I spent all the money I had and went to old Hutch again and told him that I'd have to have some kind of job. Well, what can you do? He asked me. I told him I could do most anything around a mine. Well, can you run a car? I'm a miner, but I can run car. All right, come on in the morning. That day I met Dave O'Neill downtown. I had known him in Tuscarora. He handed me a $5 gold piece saying, Bill, you might need this. I said to him, I am broke, Dave, but I ain't going to work in the morning. Well, he said, keep it anyway. You can hand it to me payday. Loans of this kind were a general custom among the miners, and it was seldom or never that they were not repaid. Within the last three years, Herman Andrig, whom, with whom I had worked in Silver City when he was a champion driller, repaid a loan I made to him more than a quarter of a century ago. I went to the old shaft house, rolled up my blankets, and carried them to the blame bunkhouse. The bunk next door to the door was vacant. This just suited me. The bunkhouse was a long rambling place with bunks built too high along the walls. Accommodating, accommodating I suppose, about 60 men. The air was none too good at best as the opening and shutting of the door was almost the only ventilation. In the bunkhouse, while we sat around the stove or lolled in the bunks, all the old tales of the different mining camps would be related by the men who had been in the scene of the action or who had heard the stories firsthand. Bill Pooley, a cousin Jack, as we called the Cornishman, of whom there were many in Silver City, was a good storyteller. He once told us about a friend of his who had had smallpox. Bill said, when he got well, he was so deep pitted that he had to shave himself with a brace and a bit. Nothing pleased the, co uh, pleased the cousin Jacks better than to get a lease where they could make wages or a little more. They called this tributing. A number of them had tributed on the poor man mine. Simon Harris, the superintendent of the mine, decided to stop this kind of work and to work all the men on wages. Eight or ten of the Cousin Jacks were sitting around a big table in the brewery saloon. They were complaining and lamenting about the loss of their tributes, when one of the group said to another, See here, Tussie, can't they pay? Can't they pay, uh, pray for tributes? Tussie answered, It's been a long time since I made a prayer, but I'll try. He began, Dear Lord, dost thee know Simon Harris, superintendent of the poor man mine? If thee know him, we wish for thee to take him and put him in hell, and there let the bugger frizzle and fry until he give us back what we just tributes. And when he do, dear Lord, we ask thee to take him out of hell again and grease him up and uh, and grease him up a bit and turn off him loose. Amen.
All were pleased with the prayer and bought another gallon of beer in Tussie's honor. Like all prayers, however, it was ineffective. Leasing was abolished and the cousin Jacks lost their tribute. There were six or seven car men in the Blaine mine. We started work ahead of the miners. Our work was to push the cars in the tunnel back to the chutes where the men were working in the stopes above. When we lifted the gates in the chutes, the cars would fill without any trouble. It was only from the face of the tunnel before connections were made with the adjoining blackjack mine that we had any shoveling to do. When the cars were loaded, we would push them out and going down a place called the shortcut, we would step out on the footboard behind and the cars would gain such speed that we could ride all the way to the dump. The ore we dumped in a bin and from there it was a run to the mill which stood in the canyon a few hundred yards below the tunnel. After a few days, I was put to work in the shortcut stopes. In my stope on the opposite shift worked a man by the name of Matt McKellen. When he became shift boss, I was working for him. He came into the stope one day when I had a platform rigged up. Leaning his arms on the staging, he began talking about old times in Pennsylvania. He said, you heard of the Molly Maguires? I said that I had. Everyone had heard of the Molly Maguires. But he went on, you never heard how they was trapped. There was a certain Franklin B. Gowen who was a manager or of one or more of the mines in the Shemokin Valley. He decided to wipe out the Molly McGuire's, which was a kind of labor organization that would not stand for reduction of wages. Go and employ the Pinkerton detective agent and they sent one of the stool pigeons whose real name was McParland. He came into Pottsville as James McKenna. He had a little bundle tied on the end of a stick over his shoulder when he walked into town and inquired for a place to stop. He found a boarding house that suited him. One evening, he went as though by chance into Barney Hogle's saloon and invited everybody in the place to have a drink. When he had paid for the drinks, he displayed a roll of bills and incidentally remarked that he had just quit his ship at Philadelphia, that he had got tired of the sea and was going to get a job on land for a while if he could. He asked Hogle if he could get work in the neighborhood. Now, Hogle was one of the bond masters of the Molly Maguires. That is, he was one of the leaders of this organization that had been transplanted from Ireland and now in Pennsylvania was made up principally of coal miners. Hogel was also a saloon keeper and he had spent a seen young McKenna's wad of money. The young Irishman was a good spender and Hogel wanted to cultivate him as a customer, but not seeming to want anxious, not wanting to seem anxious in this regard, he answered McKenna by saying that it took a pretty good man to hold a job there. McKenna flared up. I am a pretty good man, he said, buying another drink. I'll sing a song, dance a jig, or fight with any man in the house for the whiskey for everybody. He sang an Irish song, but danced, he danced an Irish jig. Looking about, he saw a likely lad sizing him up. Sidling up to the young man, he said, Is it yeez that'll be wanting to try me out? I will that, was the reply. So everyone adjourned to the handball court out in the rear. McKenna played handball a few minutes, and then they stripped for the fight, which was to be a fair go. The audience was all Irish, and nothing uh, tickled their fancy more than a good fight. They selected a referee and squared off. The miner cut McKenna on the cheek, but Mac countered to the jaw with his left and jabbed his right to the ribs. That's a boy, shouted a voice, and then with the shaft left to the chin, the miner drove Mac against the end wall. Mac recovered quickly and with both hands punched the miner about the body, forcing him to cinch. The next round, the miner fainted with his left and landed a slam on Mac's nose. The blood spurted as Mac swung and got the young fellow at the point of the jaw, keeling him over. The fight was finished. Everyone had been highly pleased. McKenna washed his bloody nose, his right eye was nearly closed, and shaking hands with the young miner, he said, "Yous were a better man than I thought she was. Back in the bar room, there was more drinking and dancing. It was declared by all to have been a fine fight. McKenna patronized this place frequently and got work through the influence of Hogel. All of his associates were Molly McGuire's, which was just what he wanted. Some time later, he was asked to become a Molly McGuire. Of course, he readily assented, but said that to be a good Molly Maguire, perhaps one ought to have had more experience than had fallen to his lot. It was but a short time after that he had joined that he was employed in some kind of official capacity in the organization. This gave him the opportunity for which he was looking. Through the skullduggery of this detective, a number of young miners were involved in a murder, or at least they were mixed up in it to such an extent that they were charged with the murder. A warrant was issued for Tom Hurley. McKenna, who by this time was suspected by the miners, saw Hurley on a train and started after him. Hurley went to the rear of the train. McKenna and the other dicks who were with him were intercepted here and there in the following him, and Hurley had time to drop off the train. When the young miners appeared for trial, McKenna testified against them and gave his name as James McParland, a Pinkerton detective. The price the Molly McGuire's paid for trusting their affairs to a saloon keeper was the lives of 10 of their members who were executed and 14 who were sentenced from two to seven years in the penitentiary. 
McParland would probably have been unable to wriggle his slimy way into the organization without Hogel's help. This was the first time I had ever heard of an agent provocateur. I later learned that it was the first time that such a method had been used against the working class in America. McLean's story made a deep impression on me. As an aside here, for those who don't know, the Molly Maguires were a underground resistance movement that formed in Ireland to oppose the English occupation of Ireland and carried out acts of terrorist violence in the resistance against English occupation of Ireland. Uh, after the famine, a large number of Irish people, of course, came to the United States and um, many members of the Molly Maguires came with them, you know, as migrants uh, looking for work. Um, in the run up to the war, uh, the War of Independence in 1916. Um, and the Molly Maguires actually were the first labor organization in the United States. And most of the early labor unions were started by people who either had been Molly Maguires or had known people and learned from people who were Molly Maguires. And so uh, this underground resistance movement in Ireland became um, in a very real way uh, the, the seeds for the organized resistance of the working class in America. And so um, a lot of people who st have studied that history would argue that the history of American labor movements and labor organizing actually starts in Ireland um, with the Mollies. Anyway, back to the book. On June 19th, 1896, I was working with two others, cutting out for a station in the Blaine Tunnel where they were going to sink a shaft. I was I was up on a stage and got down to ask one of the carmen if I could ride his car out. When he, with his ascent, I started. A big rock on the front end of the car struck the first chute I came to, tipping it up so that my right hand got caught between the car and the bottom of the chute, getting badly mangled. My candle had been put out by the jolt and I was left in total darkness. I groped my way back to where old big Barney Quigley was working on a cross cut. I called to him and he came out and walked with me to the doctor's office. We were about 3,000 feet in the tunnel then. And there was no first aid or bandages. It was just a question of getting there with somehow and keeping the bleeding hand from knocking against the wall as we went out. I remember that even at this late season of the year, we walked through open cuts where the snow was more than six feet deep. When we got to the doctor, he said that part of my hand would have to be amputated. I told him that I did not want to go through life doubly crippled. I was already handicapped by the loss of an eye. And if there was any chance of saving the hand, I wanted him to try to do it. He said, we'll try and dress the hand. I refused to take an anesthetic in spite of the pain because I was afraid that he would take off my fingers while I was unconscious. After some days, the hand showed that it was beginning to mend. It had to be dressed every day and I was carried, or, and I carried it in a sling a long time. My wife and little girl had then just come to Silver City. While I was looking for a house to live in, we were stopping at the Idaho Hotel. As I was unable to work because of the broken hand, the miners took up a collection and presented me with the person money that tided us over this emergency very well. I bought a two-room house from a miner named Schilling who was leaving camp, paying part down and the rest in installments. We moved into our new home. In the early part of the following August, Edward Boyce, president of the Western Federation of Miners, came to Silver City for the purpose of organizing the miners. Two meetings were held in the county courthouse, one on the 8th and one on the 10th of August. I attended both, though I did not know then that I would ever be able to go back to work in the mines as I was still carrying my arm in a sling. But I was greatly interested in what Boyce had to say. Here was a man who had been through Cordia Lane's strike of 1892. He was tall, slender, had a fine head with thin hair, and his features were good, but his teeth were prominent. And this was due to salivation contracted while working with Quicksilver in a quartz mine. It's a vocational disease met with quite often among millmen. With more than a thousand other miners, he had been arrested by the federal soldiers when they were sent to the Cordia Lanes at the request of Gov Governor Shoup. A bullpen was put in which, the, uh, in which the prisoners were confined for more than six months. This was a rough lumber structure two stories high. There was no sanitation provided, and the excrement of the men above dripped through the cranks, cracks in the plank floor on the men below. They became vermin infested and diseased, and some of them died. The Helena Frisco mill had been blown up. A story afterward appeared in Collier's Weekly implicating George A. Pettibone. Pettibone was the head of the assembly of the Knights of Labor at Gem. He was already well known among the miners, and the story related in a graphic manner how some boxes of powder had been put into the water flume some hundreds of feet up the mountainside. The boxes slid down the flume at a tremendous velocity and exploded when they struck the mill. It was a long gun. The unreliability of the story was shown in the attempts to implicate Pettibone by asserting that he had been so badly injured that he lost one of his arms. I knew Pettibone in after years, and neither one 
of his arms or hands had ever been hurt, though his feelings were badly embittered by the conditions of the mining camps in Cordillalans before the strike of 92. We could never forget the maggots in the meat, nor the swarthy weasel-faced stool pigeon called Serengo in the employee of the Mine Owners Association, organized by John Hayes Hammond. Boyce related how the Western Federation of Miners had been conceived while he and 13 others were in the Ada County Prison at Boise, Idaho. Jim Hawley, their attorney who had been a miner, suggested to them that all the miners of the West should come together in one organization. This thought met with the approval of the prisoners, as the miners' unions then in existence were scattered assemblies of the Knights of Labor. Boyce explained how, when they were released, a convention was called on May 13, 1893 in Butte, Montana, and the Western Federation of Miners was arrested. He described the first big strike that occurred after the formation of the Western Federation of Miners. This was in Cripple Creek, Colorado in 1894. Every man in the district had gone on strike to prevent a reduction of wages and to establish the eight-hour day. Some of the mine owners of this district, then reputed to be millionaires, had formed themselves into an organization called the Mine Owners Association. They knew that they could not depend upon Governor Wade, who had been a miner and was elected on a populist ticket, but they knew that they could rely on the county commissioners and the sheriff of what was then El Paso County. These officers, at the instigation of the Mine Owners Association, hired and equipped a small army of deputies, 1,300 or more men, who were provided with saddle horses, gatling guns, and other up-to-date instruments of war. Previous to this, the governor had set the militia to the district, but upon investigation found that there was no occasion for the presence of soldiers and withdrew them. So the sheriff mobilized his deputies and started to Cripple Creek. 200 of them got as far as Wilbur. The miners learned of their presence and sent, one of, uh, and sent a detachment of men against them. There was some shooting and one or two were killed on each side. Governor Waite now made a personal investigation. He addressed the miners in their hall at Altman and called out the militia at once and sent them to Cripple Creek with instructions to place themselves between the miners and the hired thugs. The miners were barricaded upon the crest of Bull Hill where they had a strong fort and proposed to fight to the finish in protection of their wives and families and their rights as working men. The commanding officer, General Brooks, notified the assembled deputies that if they did not disperse, he would fire upon them. They left the camp the next day for Colorado Springs. They were so incensed at their failure at Cripple Creek that they tarred and feathered Tarney, the adjutant general of the state who was in charge of the soldiers at Cripple Creek. Governor Waite had been elected by the workers of the state. This the miners knew or the miners knew that they couldn't fool with him because upon his taking office, he had ordered out the militia and had trained their cannon on the city hall in Denver, where the previous office holders representing the mine owners and their business interests had refused to give up office. Boyce reminded us that Governor Waite had the distinction of being the only governor in the United States who had ever called out the soldiers to protect the workers. He told us about the conviction of Ed Lyons and Mike Tully, who had been charged with blowing up the strong mine. Later, they were released from the penitentiary and the stockholders in the mine sued Sam Strong, one of the owners, for the damages resulting from the explosion. At these meetings, Boyce initiated several hundred charter members of the Silver City Miners Union Number no. 66 of the Western Federation of Miners. That is a good strong pledge, said I to Tom Fry, who was standing at my shoulder. The courtroom where the meetings were held was crowded and there were miners and mill workers from the blackjack mine, the Florida mine, the trade dollar, the Blaine, the poor man, and the smaller mines of the camp. Every seat and every bit of standing room was filled. The charter was held open for some time to allow as many as possible to become members. I was elected a member of the finance committee and at various times filled the different offices of the union. When I was in Silver City, I never missed a meeting of the miners' union, except when I was working on the night shift, and I always took an active part in the work of the organization. Two others and myself went as a committee to visit the Blackjack Mine and invite one John Taylor, who was working there, either to become a member of the union or leave the camp. Taylor became indignant and said that the superintendent told him he did not need to join the union. We told him that the superintendent was not running the union. The union is being run by the men of this camp. We had no further discussion with him, but when the shift came out of the mine at noon, all the men around the bunkhouse, including the night shift, resolved themselves into a committee on the whole and told Taylor to roll his blankets and hit the trail. He did this without any loss of time. I met Taylor the years later under strange circumstances. Stewart, the master mechanic at the trade dollar mill, was another man to whom we had to extend a special invitation to join the union. We explained to him that he could make no dis or we could make no distinctions as to men in the camp. They wanted to make it a thoroughly organized camp and that we, he would get as much benefit as any other member, sick and death benefits as well as hospital service, for the union very soon owned its own hospital. 
Stewart joined under protest and in after years attempted to repay me with interest, but that is another story. There were nearly a thousand men employed in Silver City. There was a continual coming and going, but these two were the only men with whom we had any trouble. The membership included all those workers in the mines, skilled and unskilled alike, and also those in and around the mills. There was only a slight difference in pay between the skilled and the unskilled men. As the Western Federation of Miners developed, all of its struggles were for the men underneath, for the lower paid men, as we came to learn that when the unskilled worker got a wage upon which he could live decently, there was no danger of the skilled men falling below this level. All the men in and around the mines worked every day of the week, including Sundays, and the mills were never closed down even for holidays. In 1896, in his report to annual report to the Western Federation of Miners, Ed Boy said that he hoped that before the time of the next convention, the martial tread of 20,000 armed miners would be heard throughout the West, that the time had come when the miners would have to protect themselves from thugs such as were used in Cordialons and Cripple Creek and in Leadville, and he trusted every miner would get a modern rifle and a supply of ammunition. I think modern leftists need to read that passage. Uh, at one time, I was on a committee appointed to see Joseph Hutchinson, the manager of the Trade Dollar Mining Company, about the pay of the men who were sinking. There was at that time a winds being sunk on the Trade Dollar Mine for which the men were being paid only $3 and a half a day, which was 50 cents less than the union wage for sinking. Hutchinson said, well, that complies with your constitution, taking a copy of the constitution of the union from his desk. There is no provision here for sinking a winds. Taking a copy of the Constitution from my pocket, I said, if you will read this, you will see that we have corrected that error. Most men would rather work in a shaft than in a winds. At least there is no reason why the wages should not be the same. I agree to that, he told us, but I wish that you would change your constitution, or when you change your constitution, you would be good enough to keep us supplied with the latest issue. It was not always because of skill or ability that men became superintendents or managers. One night, there was a fire in the Chinese laundry in the back street. Someone suggested that the place ought to be blown up to keep the fire from spreading. Joe Hutchinson remarked that a box of powder would do the work. I told him, you do not want to put 50 pounds of powder under that shack. You'll break every window in town. Four or five pounds will lift it out by the roots. They got the fire under control without the use of powder. The superintendent had probably never used a pound of powder in his life. He was superintendent through the success of his father. I haven't described Silver City, which was built in a canyon between two towering peaks, War Eagle and the Florida Mountains. The bottom of the gulch was full of boulders and rocks which had been turned up by the early gold diggers. The town was but two streets wide. The rear street occupied by prostitutes, black, white, and Chinese. There were 17 saloons in the town besides other business houses. In the winter, the snow was often packed as deep as the first story windows. The little houses and cabins of the miners would be covered, nothing but the stovepipe sticking up through the snow. I had marked the trail to my house by sticking willows down on either side and pulling them up as the snow increased in depth. One night I dropped into the corner saloon. There is a corner saloon in every mining camp, and this one differed little from any of them. There was a billiard and a pool table, a stud poker and a faro game were running. I went over to the faro game, put down a dollar and one on the turn. Give me silver, I said to the dealer and asking the boys who was standing around to have a drink we went over to the bar i noticed a man sitting in a corner with his hat pulled down over his face i asked ben hastings the bartender who is that man ben answered that's old mccann he don't drink much but he'd sell his soul for a dose of morphine i called to mccann come on partner have a drink as he came up he pushed his hat back a little and said hello bill you don't remember me i used to know you in tuscarora staring at his emaciated face at last i recognized his features haggard and aged by the use of the drug to which he was addicted. <clears throat> As I went out later, I noticed McCann speaking to one of the boys who was worked in the $2.8 mine. And the next morning on my way to work, I saw a light in McCann's cabin, and that evening I heard that he had gone to the stage office early in the morning, having dragged down a box on a hand sledge to be shipped out. The sheriff was at the stage office when McCann arrived there. He took McCann and the box to his office. When the box was opened, there it was found to contain a lot of rich ore, and McCann was charged with robbery and put in jail. After several hours in the cell, his cravings began. He called the sheriff and said to him, uh, A.B., you know that on account of my nerves, I have been taking morphine, and I've got so I can't get along without it. You'll get me some at the post office drugstore. If, if you tell them there it's for me, they'll know how much I want. Why, sure, Mac, I'll do that, said the sheriff. He went away, and Mac began pacing up and down the cell. Already his temples were throbbing, his body wet with cold sweat. Up and down, up and down he went, more restless and goaded every minute. 
The hours dragged along, but the sheriff did not come back. In the night, he thought he was going to die. His tortured nerves seemed to crack and ravel inside him. Before morning came, he longed for death. He called to the guard, his voice shaken. I got to get some morphine. You can get it. The guard answered, well, I can't leave here any more than you can. You'll have to wait till the sheriff comes in the morning. It was late when uh, Croker, uh, I'm not sure how to say his name, uh, Crocheron, uh, the sheriff, came back. Mac was standing at the door of the cell. He reached a scrawny arm scarred with many jams of the hypodermic needle through the bars of the cell and said desperately, give it to me, Sheriff. For God's sake, give it to me. I'm dying. The Sheriff pulled a little blue bottle out of his pocket. Well, I'll give it to you, Mac, but I must have the names of the men who gave you that order to ship out. Mac staggered, tripped on the food pan and collapsed on the floor. Dragging himself back to the bars, he looked at the Sheriff in the eyes and said, I can't tell you. The Sheriff walked off and left Mac in his agony. A short time later, the court was in session and Mac, more dead than alive, was brought in for trial. The prosecuting attorney told him, McCann, the mining company has no desire to prosecute you, but they do want to know the names of the men who gave you that ore. McCann, lifting his worn and exhausted face, said, I cannot tell you. He was convicted and sentenced to seven years in the Boise Penitentiary, and he died there while serving his term. Ben had said he would sell his soul for a dose of morphine, but he had told but he suffered untold agonies rather than sell his friends. On the 28th of June, 1897, my youngest daughter was born. My wife did not recover her health for months. She was bedfast and the domestic care of the family fell entirely upon my shoulders as there was not a woman or girl in the camp that we could get to work outside her own home. They came up in the evenings after their own work was done and helped us in a neighborly way. Uh, but until the wife of the colored barber came to town, I had to do the work myself. The baby from its birth slept with me. Afraid of smothering her, if I laid her at my side every night, I put her on my breast. If she had been in a cradle, I should not have heard her cry when she was hungry. So soundly did I sleep. Though I was not working, the butcher and storekeeper and others with whom I dealt said to me, well, don't you worry, Bill, things will be all right soon. Remember, you can always have anything you want from us. At that time, I gambled some and drank a little, but I quit both. While I had sometimes made winnings, in the long run, I had been much the loser. Sometimes I took my wife to visit the neighbors, the baby in one arm and her in the other. I remember one evening being down to see Mrs. Morris at the foot of the hill. When we started home, there had been a drift of snow and I had my wife on one arm, the baby on the other and the little girl on my back. I carried them all three up the hill. The Blaine mine was worked through a tunnel in the side of a mountain and the mining was done well above as well as below the level of the tunnel. Coming out, we walked Indian file on a plank laid between the tracks. One day, Theodore Buckle, a florid, big, fine-looking young Hollander, was just behind me, and we scuffled and joked as we went along. He went to dinner in a boarding house. I ate my lunch in the blacksmith shop. Going back to the mine after dinner, he was a few minutes ahead of me. Some of the men had to climb 100 feet and 10 feet to the first level above, and from there to the stopes, which were still above this. There were some ahead of Buckle, some behind him. He was just climbing up into the stope when a slab of rock fell and crushed the life out of him. We managed to raise the rock high enough to get his body from under it and carried it down the 110 foot level. There for want of a better stretcher, we tied his corpse to a short ladder, which we lowered down the manway to the main tunnel. We sent a committee to town with the body. On another occasion, we heard a shot back down near the station on the same 110 foot level. Then someone called to us and we hurried out to find the McDonald who had only been at work a short time had laid or had had his entire face blown off. He was still alive and we contrived to lower him down the manway. One of the boys had run out ahead and sent for a wagon. We got him to the hospital as quickly as we could, where he soon died. McDonald had evidently been biting a fulminating cap to fasten it on a fuse that he was getting ready to fire his holes. Many of the miners did this instead of using their knives to clinch the cap or pinchers that were made for the purpose. The question of the eight hour day was beginning to stir the miners of Idaho. And at the coming session of the legislature, they were going to try and have a bill enacted to provide for an eight hour day for men employed in mines, mills and smelters. Joseph Hutchinson was sent as a lobbyist, supplied with funds by the trade dollar company to work against the bill. This action could be expected from the mine owners, but James Sovereign, one time master workman of the Knights of Labor, then editor and the paper owner by the miners union of Cordy Alons, the Idaho State Tribune, did a treacherous piece of work in publishing an editorial against the eight hour law. He proved a faker and a sellout, no better than his predecessor, Powderly. The bill was defeated by the legislature, but later established by the miners. It was the Western Federation of Miners, through its attorney, John H. Murphy, that carried the first eight-hour law passed in the United States, the Utah law, to the United States Supreme Court. 
or is declared constitutional. But the miners and the men, uh, mill men of Utah had to fight to compel its enforcement. I was elected as a delegate from the Silver City Miners Union to the Convention of the Western Federation of Miners, which was held in 1898 in Salt Lake City. And that is the end of chapter four. Bill Haywood's book, I'll be reading another chapter soon. Uh, please do like and subscribe the channel if you want to see more chapters. Uh, leave comments if you've got any questions. I'm happy to answer any questions about the material in the book, um, about Haywood or any of that other uh, related content. Um, thanks for watching.